Well, good afternoon, everybody. A few people are st probably still uh, filtering into the room, but uh, pretty good turnout for uh, hopefully succinct bull sessions here because we have a roundtable session tonight. And uh, I'm joined here by my dear colleagues, Ken Kabula. Hugh McManus is also checking in. One of the blessings of the of the viral situation that we're in is that Hugh has been landlocked for long enough that we actually get to talk to him. He spends less time on airplanes over oceans. So this is a good thing. And Kim Butcher is also with us. So, hey, everybody, how are you doing? Pretty good. It's a beautiful afternoon up here. Uh, my wife is sitting out on the patio with a glass of wine. It's a, it's a really nice afternoon. So. Okay, so let's go ahead and keep this short. This is, as promised, our mailbag edition that we're going to do once a month. We're going to keep it uh, fairly brief unless we get really deep into some uh, conversation on, on a topic. But the mailbag, again, I was reminded that Ben Franklin was the first Postmaster General. and. Uh, well, the Postmaster General is in the news quite a bit these days, but most importantly, anytime we do this, and this relates back to what we were just talking about with the face-to-face -face visits that we do, uh, it's always an adventure and it's always a pleasant adventure when we begin exploring uh, your questions and the things you want to talk about. It's especially true in person. I want to thank, uh, there's many people here today that have sent questions and things you wanted to talk about, and we appreciate that. Go ahead and get officially underway. We will be talking about real companies and the analysis and philosophy, the techniques of the modern investment club movement. No investment recommendation is intended. This is truly all about demonstration and illustration of those things. Uh, we'll talk about our own opinions and those sort of things. We may own shares of companies. We'll try to disclose that, try to remember, but keep in mind that that we could have ownership stakes in some of these that we talk about. Um, I doubt that anything I have to say about things in my Robin Hood portfolio would move any market, but uh, that may not be true for Hugh and Ken. They tend to move markets just by uh, rolling out of <laughs> <Yeah>. that. <laughs> that sure is it. <laughs> All right. So if you'd like a round table reminder, so again, we have one tonight, but on a monthly basis, we come together and do a webcast. If you'd like to be added to the reminder list for that, nkabula1 at comcast.net is the email. If you have follow-up questions to this session, please send me an email at markr at manifestinvesting.com. And after a couple weeks of vacation, I am getting caught up on my inbox. All right, just as our reminder, we started doing this last month. I do think it's something worthy. If for no other reason, it pushes us into doing things that we should be doing and exploring topics that we should be exploring. And uh, we do keep a running bullpen or a queue. We will be continuing our discussions about early stage companies and uh, different forms of analysis. You'll probably see some of that tonight at the round table. We will be talking about the banks at the top of the manifest screens. They are, by the way, subsiding a little bit as things calm down. Um, as Banks tend to plateau out a little bit from where they've been going the last several years. And again, we'll take a look at some of those topics, but this one is dedicated to the mailbag and literally what's on your mind. So let's go ahead and get underway. This question actually came from Gail Miller of the Lancaster, Pennsylvania Moneymakers, and she'd like us to go into a, a brief discussion of why do we use sales growth forecast? When we're talking about the size, size diversification of a portfolio, she goes on to point out that uh, what we doesn't do doesn't necessarily line up with value line. And Gail, that never bothers us when things that we do don't line up. We like it when our stuff makes sense because we can show in so many ways how using market cap can be vulnerable and that sort of thing. So again, there are gonna be differences. So why would we use sales growth by, at Manifest to determine size and diversification? And she wants to be able to explain this to her club members. Some of them may be attending and she was gonna actually access the YouTube and I, I told her we'd go ahead and try to kick it around here. Ken, it's one of your favorite subjects. Would you like to take the floor? And Well, sure. Uh, Better Investing uh, has traditionally defined 
uh, sales growth uh, in two different ways. It's, it's looked at amount of sales, uh, and that right now is the uh, definition that appears in the tools. Uh, but Mr. Nicholson also defines sales by looking at uh, growth uh, of sales. Uh, when you look at amount of sales right now, uh, the definition is uh, if a company sells less than one uh, billion dollars in goods or services, then it's a small company. If it sells more than 10 billion in goods or services, then it's a large company. And something in that middle range between 1 billion and 10 billion of goods or services sold makes it a medium sized company. Notice uh, I've never used the word capitalization uh, because Better Investing has never believed that a capitalization which is roughly the number of shares times the stock price. Better investing has never believed that capitalization really uh, captures the size of a company. I ask you to go back to the Great Recession and remind yourself that uh, for periods of time, Ford Motor Company was a small cap company. Its stock was trading at uh, a dollar something uh, and when you multiplied a dollar something times the number of shares, you didn't get a very large number. It wasn't large enough to move it even into the mid cap uh, area. So we, we've steered away in better investing from capitalization for a long while. Uh, instead, depending on the definitions that Mr. Nicholson put forth, uh, the problem with we're looking at number of sales, amount of sales uh, for goods or services, is that that number, uh, because it's based on uh, dollars, uh, has to be uh, rethought every uh, six or seven years, especially uh, if inflation really takes off. It might have to be rethought even more often than that. Uh, and that means that that number changes. I can remember different categories of small, medium, and large when I first started with Better Investing. And I know that those numbers have changed at least three times uh, over the course of my 26 years with Better Investing and perhaps even more than that. Uh, the other definition that hasn't changed, however, and that still remains roughly uh, the same as it did back in the 40s when it was proposed, uh, was using the growth of sales to decide whether a company was small, medium, or large. And again, uh, we know that the, when you plot the growth onto a, uh, a bar graph, uh, you're going to get roughly a bell curve. And we knew that the stocks to one side of that bell curve were going to be called large, and those to the other side were going to be called small. And those in the middle at the height of the bell uh, were going to be called medium-sized, and that medium-sized really represented uh, the, the core uh, of the market. Uh, Nicholson said to us that uh, companies that grew their sales at 7% or less, and this isn't including anything about the dividend, it's just straight sales growth at 7% or less. He categorized those as large. Uh, he categorized those that grew their sales at 12% or more as small, and then put those that grew sales from 7 to 12 uh, in the middle and called them medium. Um, I wish that he would have called them uh, slower growing, uh, normal growth, and faster growing, or something along those lines, because I think that made a lot of sense if you talk about growth to begin with. And the key to the whole thing was that uh, from the very beginning, Better Investing suggested that your portfolio should have companies of all three sizes within their portfolio. They should have large companies, they should have small companies, and most importantly, medium-sized companies. And the suggested goals to strive for uh, were 25% large, 25% small, and 50% medium. And you didn't have to be obsessive about those numbers. You could, you could come close to them. And uh, if you were an aggressive kind of investor, you might lean towards the 
a small category a little bit more. And if you were a conservative type investor, you might lead towards the large category a little bit more. But Nicholson suggested that if you kept uh, roughly this kind of diversity in your portfolio, you should be able to grow at that 15% per year rate, which tended to double your money then every five years uh, as you kept uh, investing. So there's where the difference comes in. One talks about amount uh, of sales uh, and categorizes by amount of goods or services sold. And the other talks about rate of sales growth for goods and services. Uh, the amount number is going to have to be adjusted every so often because it's in dollars. The other uh, figure, the rate is basically still pretty good. Uh, basically, the way it was formulated back in the 40s, uh, that's the 1940s, and uh, where it stands today. Thanks, Ken. Yeah, and just to, to, so you don't feel like you're the Lone Ranger, Gail, um, that the blue box on the lower left there is from a Forbes.com survey of, you know, what's the measure of a company's size. And you'll notice that the opinions from a fairly good size of investors is pretty divided. Uh, lots of different opinions, and it's it's really kind of fascinating that we're basically suggesting is that either the bottom one or that one is the right answer. So uh, again, it's it's an area of confusion and uh, debate, but uh, for all the reasons that Ken said, th that's the reason that we like it. I'll just drive it home with a couple of other key points. Again, the, the sales growth of an enterprise, of a company, uh, it follows the same type of uh, life cycle curve that that product does up on the upper right. And the rate of growth basically tells you where you're at along this timeline. You know, younger companies are faster growing. You know, you're in this growth stage here where you have basically double digit growth. And then most companies reach a point of market saturation and maturity where we get that normal slowing of growth. We'll probably be talking about one of those here in a few minutes. And then if they don't reinvent themselves or they're, you know, something becomes obsolete or there are a number of reasons that the, the right-hand side can happen and growth actually goes negative. Uh, so the sales growth forecast basically gives you some impression as to where you're at on that curve. The other thing that we really like to reinforce this time of year as Ken just said, we believe in all of the above investing, which means we want small, medium, and large companies, or translated per Ken to small, smaller being faster growing, and then the workhorses in the middle, and the slower growing blue chips to make a balanced portfolio. We really turn our attention this time of year to the, the small companies, those growing in double digits uh, across the board. And over the last five years, we've been pretty successful at identifying very high quality companies that are also growing faster. And uh, in fact, we're doing pretty well this year. I don't want to talk about it because we're getting close to the finish line, but uh, <laughs> you know, God willing, we're, we're going to be six for six come Halloween. <laughs> All right. To grab you and put a mask on you, Mark, you, real quick. You need right. to mu muzzle me with a mask. And, and the other thing, the second point, I mean, this is a big point. That's a huge point about identifying the characteristics of a company based on its growth expectations. But the other thing comes down to portfolio design and the design of a portfolio, trying to target somewhere in that the weighted average uh, sales growth forecast of 12% plus or minus, as Ken was suggesting, if you're a younger or risk uh, tolerant person, you might drive the numbers up. If you're more experienced or you're trying to preserve capital, you might drive that number down to nine or 10. But again, the, the design of the portfolio, we see these as the three most important characteristics in, in portfolio design. That being the return forecast, the quality of the portfolio, and uh, the forecast, average forecasted sales growth rate. And this happens to be 10 cup. So you can see the companies that are in 10 cup and a model portfolio we run at Manifest Investing. And you can see that this is a fairly ambitious overall situation. Anything else you want to add to that, Ken or Hugh or Kim? 
I think it provides oh, a pretty good basis for a discussion within your club now, Mark. Okay. Anybody else? No, I was just thinking two things, Mark, uh, which is, and I just noticed this over the years, that, yeah, we all believe in diversification because that's the one, it doesn't matter whether people are traders or whatever, they all talk about diversification. That, get, that gets hammered into you. I, I've never practiced it. I've wanted to, and I've, it's not that I don't believe in it, but it happens by accident. As I've said many times before, when you're younger, you're kind of playing to win. And as you get closer to retirement, you're investing not to lose. And that shift ha happens suddenly over time. When you're a very young investor, you don't have enough money to, invest, to diversify truly, unless you really want to get into an index fund. So what happens is you buy a quality company, and it's a leader in an industry, and when you have a number one company, you're less inclined to buy number two. And so you go search for another industry to look at. Who's the winner there? And just over time, you end up having a portfolio that is certainly more diversified later on than it was at the start. So it's a function, I think, of growing older and changing your outlook and what you're trying to accomplish. You know? Sure. Okay, well, we're going to circle back to that. Could, well, segue. well, Mark, I, I want to I react just a little bit to, to what he said, though, because... I think there's two kinds of diversification in, and one of them I don't chase at all. One of them I agree with you happens, uh, just happens, uh, and that's diversity by uh, field. If, if you're constantly looking for good, solid companies, then uh, I think that takes you through many different uh, sectors and many different industries, and I think gives you a, a portfolio that doesn't all uh, you know consists of oil stocks or communication stocks or something like that. Uh, but I do have to work, uh, especially uh, when I was a little bit younger. I, I did have to work uh, pretty pretty uh, regularly to keep the small side of my portfolio uh, represented within my my total portfolios, which were growing and. And in some cases, growing pretty well. I did have to to keep up the idea that I wanted small companies, and the reason being that if I was able to pick great small companies, uh, they no longer were small companies ten years later or twelve years later. And mm -hmm. I've held a lot of my companies for a long time, so uh, I I felt that I did have to do a, and still do a little bit of work on the small side. Uh, not so much work uh, looking up medium size and big ones anymore, but but just keeping alert to how much small I have in my portfolio and trying to keep that percentage up around 18, 20, 22, some you know percent of the whole the whole mix. Yeah, absolutely, it's a never-ending quest, and we'll, we can actually talk about that in a few minutes when we talk about Hughes actual investments. All right, let's go ahead and tackle a question that was submitted by Steve Gideon about Heiko. It's, it's something that we have noticed for quite some time. It basically, why is the PAR, the projected annual return for the one class of stocks, have a substantially different return forecast than the A shares? And uh, this type of difference has been fairly common. And... Uh, I look to see if there's any deeper explanations for this because the only difference between the two shares are voting rights. And uh, I don't know if uh, Ken or Kim or Hugh, if you guys have ever run into anything quite like this, because we notice, you know, like with Google, with the multiple classes of shares, we see a slight difference between the two classes. Uh, but this is this one has really been out there quite a while. What you're looking at on the page here is a stock charts graphic of a comparison between the normal regular class shares and the A class shares for Heiko going back five years. And what this is showing is again it's a ratio. So if they were if they were equal, the number would be one. But in this case you see that the A shares run about 20 to 25 percent higher in stock price. And it's fairly consistent. In fact, there's only one time during that five-year period where the two were on par with each other. Par, I shouldn't use par. Uh, equal to each other. And that was just briefly during this latest uh, downdraft in the market. So the 20% difference is persistent. And I think we've noticed this. And I think, Ken, were you with me in St. Louis when the, 
the investment club brought this up a group of ladies in st louis or was i there by myself that time no you were there by yourself i had unfortunately a death in the family on that weekend okay, it wasn't okay. with you i remember that now now that you yeah. mentioned it sorry for your loss um so what it comes down to is these are consistently again the two classes of shares are based on the same you know fundamental underpinnings so everything on the, the two columns here left and right is identical with the exception of the price and you can see that 20 percent difference persists today and what that produces is then this difference that steve is noticing so our answer and like the ladies from st louis suggested why would you buy the regular shares when you can buy the a shares and by the way i did return back to Michigan and buy the air share shares in one of my portfolios. And uh, again, I can't see a reason why you would do that. I would do think I would, I would monitor this situation for an opportunity to, to buy them if it ever happened again where the two came together. Because I think you get that extra boost, potential boost from the, the difference in the shares. Any comments or questions on that? Well, it, it mimics the question we get about GOOG and GOOGL, uh, the two Google stocks that are differentiated by only voting rights as well. Uh, my experience with them is that they trade back and forth as to which one's higher, and they they uh, you know they they match each other very closely, uh, especially because dollar wise it's an expensive stock. Uh, they they stay pretty close together. Uh, to be honest, I wasn't aware that the gap was as large <laughs> as, uh, as it actually is. I own AGI uh, in a couple of portfolios, not uh, personal portfolios, but club portfolios. And I will be speaking with our stock watchers at our next meetings about uh, maybe we're in the wrong uh, uh, section of, of Heiko stock. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a mystery. I was stunned when I saw that picture. Because I knew I knew that it was there at least in some uh, material fashion, but I had no idea that it was this significant. My, I have a quick question, and even though this stock may be out of Florida, I don't own it. Um, each one will have their own separate voting rights, correct? No. Yeah. Okay, so then has anyone checked to see what the 14A says of executive compensation? Uh, do the A shares, which are usually the the owners and insiders have, do they get more bonuses or anything? Any incentives more? I've, I've not seen anything like that. Uh, I mean, some of the compensation structure at the company could favor one versus the other. The only externality that I can think of would be uh, in the, the rules of engagement for mutual funds that might prevent them or preclude them from buying one versus the other um, can sometimes cause that difference. That's, that is part of the explanation for Google. Uh, again, uh, rules of engagement for institutional funds as to what they can buy or not buy. Um, but I don't, I can't see anything be interesting to take a look at whether that the compensation might be a part of that, but I didn't see any sign of that. Mark, I did the analysis. Are, are both classes of stock listed in the S and P five hundred? I doubt it. I don't think so. Is HEI listed in the S and P five hundred? Probably. I wonder if that's something for me to look up. I I don't know the answer to that yeah. question. Yeah. Yeah, so that could push things around a little bit, but it doesn't explain that difference. There's no way it would ever explain that difference. Yeah. All right, so let's go ahead and press on. Well, since he was not in the air over an ocean, I, I thought maybe we'd put him on the spot here. He has been somewhat warned if he opened his email. Um, <laughs> we talk about Hugh's core portfolio, and it came up the other day in a personal conversation I had with him because we hear so much about his uh, speculative adventures. And uh, I'd be interested in hearing if you could talk, he could talk about some of the stocks that he's owned since before I met him, which was back around 1990. So we've known each other for a long time. 
And in fact, I'll even give you a launching pad, Hugh. You talked about a stock yesterday that pays you a dividend uh, that actually exceeds your purchase price for the stock. I mean. Yeah, that, that would be McDonald's, which I've owned for a very long time. There you go. I mean, so your dividend yeah. every time, every three months is more than you invested in McDonald's 30 years ago. Yeah. That is so cool. I've always had a love for McDonald's because, you know, it's the quintessential American stock. And it's so healthy. And when I, when I, I just finished with a degree, and maybe I told you this story before, it was the worst recession we ever had in Ireland. And, you know, I had planned to go to graduate school in the U.S., but in the meantime, I tried to get a job. So I went into McDonald's on O'Connell Street in Dublin to apply for a job at McDonald's. And the manager was very apologetic. He said, listen, A, we're not hiring anyone because we don't have jobs. B, we've run out of application forms, so we can't even give you that. But we're legally required to do it. So I'm now taking your job application, and I'm now explaining to you that we can't hire you. So left McDonald's and then came to the U.S. This would have been in 1984. Um, in South Bend, Indiana, on West Marion Street, at the end of the block, two blocks away, there was a McDonald's. And there were two words on that McDonald's. It says, now hiring. <laughs> and in the worst respect, everyone assured me this was the worst that America had been through since you know, the Great Depression. And I was saying, this is a great country. I am never leaving because I can always get a job. So after, I never, I didn't buy McDonald's. I was actually at home by chance. And a nephew was, he was celebrating his first communion, but I had only been to McDonald's periodically, not very often, because it was expensive in his community. And he wanted to go to McDonald's. And I said, fine. An Irish kid living in England wanted to go to McDonald's. Interesting. And then I went to McDonald's with him, and I thought, God, this place is magic. They really know how to press buttons for kids and, and get them in there. And not only kids, as I discovered, but adults. So that prompted me to buy McDonald's. It was the Shamrock and, Shakes, right? The Shamrock Shakes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, you know, if you recall, there was a time when McDonald's, um, the dividend was pitiful. It was a penny a share. Or something like that. It, was, it was very small. So it was definitely not a dividend paying stock at the time. Its ex-dividend date is Monday of next week. And the quarter, the quarterly dividend, I think, is $1.25. There's a lot of splits in between, by the way. And I'm not talking about things it puts into its milkshakes. I'm talking about actual stock splits. No, not, not recently. As I believe it's now a Dow stock. Yes. Which Pfizer, by the way, is too, but not for long. Not for any yeah, And the other one I is. saw, this is pure, purely by accident, and that was Amgen back in the, in the 80s. And that was prompted by the fact that my roommate was in biotechnology. And Genentech had drug approved. So I figured, oh my God, this is the end of the opportunity in biotech. I want to own something. And the only other company he knew about was Amgen. And he said, well, that's kind of like Genentech Light, a few months behind. Maybe they'll have a drug soon. So I just bought some of that purely on spec. And of course, that's worked out well as well. And just like McDonald's, Amgen, I believe, is going to enter the Dow in, in the next uh, makeover. I think that was released yesterday, right? That's true, and, and, and Pfizer steps the side. As yeah. the Exxon Mobil also, though. So you got two hundred year residents of the Dow stepping aside for Salesforce and Amgen. Yeah, unbelievable. Shows, I think. Well, Ken, what's what? What kind of stocks do you have that go way back? Uh, that you've got for a long time. Not well, the, the first stock I ever purchased. Uh, was after uh, much soul searching and most, much research by my wife. Uh, and uh, she decided back in the uh, mid 80s, the early 80s, I guess, that video games were going to be something really big. Uh, now, nobody that I knew of had ever played a video game. I was really into hex games. They were, were played with, with thousands of little pieces on hexagonal boards. I remember those. The, they, they thought they were the coolest thing in the world, but she had discovered video games and the company was Electronic Arts. So that was the first uh, company we ever bought at $5 a share. And we got so excited when it tripled that we sold it. So 
uh, I mean, after all, you know, the goal was to double something and we tripled it. So uh, uh, we did buy it back and it, it still did pretty well, but uh, that was the first stock. The, the second stock I ever bought uh, was supposed to be family dollar and you had to call a broker then and go through a, a human being and uh, I called the broker and uh, uh, asked her to uh, buy me a couple hundred shares of family dollar and she said fine and uh, she read me the ticker D-L-R, D-O-L-R, that was the ticker at that time. And uh, I said, yep, that's it. And she said, okay, I'll buy those and have the stuff out to you. You know, it cost a lot of money to buy stock back then, uh, back <laughs> in the old days. <laughs> so uh, we, we, we bought it. And when it came to us, I found that I owned a couple hundred shares of Dollar General, uh, which I knew nothing about. She had given me the wrong ticker and I had okayed the wrong purchase. Uh, so I still hold Dollar General to this day. It's probably split, I don't know, 40 times, 30 times. Uh, back in the 80s and 90s, it was splitting uh, once and twice a year. Uh, and it was splitting like 0.75, uh, no, 1.25 for every one, things yeah, like that. Five for four, yeah. Uh, yeah, five for four. So uh, I still own Dollar General today. That's a 30 plus year holding and uh, it's it's given me all kinds of, of great rewards. So those are the kind of, of stocks that I've held for a long time. Uh, Electronic Arts, I still don't hold it. It turned out not to be so up straight and parallel as <laughs> some of my other holdings, but Dollar General has been the old the old consistent grower. And, and I'll tell you, it's been one of the best performers in my portfolio uh, since COVID uh, came to town. It's, it's really, really been a, a, a wild star uh, at the moment. I don't think it's a buy right now, by the way, for mm -hmm. those of you quickly try to look it well, up. Well, every once in a while, I hear from somebody in the audience that worries about us being uh, too aggressive or assertive on our selling. And I had one of those people on the phone not too long ago, and I explained that I still hold in my personal portfolio. I also bought Amgen back in the 90s. I have some Merck. I have some Abbott. I have uh, companies like that with uh, cost basis that are back in the 1990s. And then I just love to repeat the story that the Mutual Club of Detroit bought Aflac back in the 1960s. So its cost basis is like 16 cents. Roxy wants to wants Pet Med Express or something. Oh, she's telling the cats to get off the table. <laughs> they're trying to walk on my computer right now. So. Pet Express. All right. Yes. And Hugh, this individual would also like you to elaborate on the reasons that you shop for stocks trading near their 52 weeks lows. So take it away. What drives that? Uh, well, it drives it because I, I think it was driven initially by the fact that you know, when you're new to investing, you get very nervous when the stock price falls. When you buy something, the stock price falls. I mean, you're, you're obviously, your you're mind, his mind did, went crazy. I think most human beings are like that. Um, but also it saves work. I mean, I, I think it's, it's relatively easy using the NAIC slash better investing approach. Certainly if you augment it by manifest investing, it makes it much easier to find quality companies. I think the, the big challenge is finding them at a good price. And you can argue with yourself using PE ratio, dividend yield, a bunch of things like that. What is a good price? I just said myself, because I've noticed this over time, when I buy things near a 52 week low, I usually have fewer regrets. And certainly biotech. The one thing I consistently noticed in biotech, number one, there's the small cap or a sm there's small in terms of their growth of revenues, if they have any. So by any measure, they are high risk companies. Most of them fail. And um, the, the, the thing I wanted to do was to avoid buying a biotech that was gonna go under. That's a really hard thing to do, by the way, because most of them disappeared. But I wanted one to go through a rough period and see if it could come through it. And one way to do that is to look at companies when they're at a five year low. Every company has a showstopper in its life. Certainly every emerging company and, and every biotech has some kind of a disaster that will happen in the clinic, um, in discovery, 
in its partnership arrangements with other companies, something like that. The good quality, the good companies with good people in them, very good technology, will weather that, come through it, and, and thrive. A good example of that is neurocrine, or neurocrine as some people call it, an emerging biotech in San Diego. A number of years ago, uh, it had a, a deal with Pfizer, among other companies. It all fell through, everything collapsed at the same time. It didn't do well in the clinic, but yet it kept its core research going, and that stock has bounced back aggressively since then. It took time, and it takes a very, very strong stomach to do that, to buy a company at its five-year low. But for an emerging company, it's just a risk aversion strategy. For a large company, I just want to get a return, and it's easier to do that if you're buying it when everyone's selling it. Yeah, and in honor of that uh, philosophy, we actually created a screen at Manifest where you can screen as is shown there for companies that are trading within 20% of their 52-week low. We try to emulate huge thinking about I want quality, so very high quality. Uh, companies that are look pretty good on a, a stock selection guide that are also near their 52-week lows. And Hugh and I have talked about this in the past that uh, Ken Janke, often, he president of uh, – Oh, National yeah. Association of Investors would talk about how just take a look at the difference between the 52-week low and the 52-week high for most companies. And you'll find that that number is quite often 50%. Uh, so why not buy them when they're at minus 50%? Uh, he always considered that to be stacking the odds in your favor. And uh, it, it, it can be quite a risk avoidance strategy, I think. So yeah, it sounds like a no-brainer to me. Certainly in the 90s, it, when, when the dot-com bubble was at full swing, there were a lot of great companies. Sigma Aldrich, which is now gone. Applebee's, yeah, that's gone too. But a lot of them were um, hitting 52-week lows in 1999. My portfolio was a disaster that year in terms of its return. Everyone was high double digits. I think I was minus 9%. But for the long term, wow, it was a phenomenal time to buy. Um, is that... Uh, dashboard Hughes View stock search result. Is that the name on the dashboard, Mark, of um, Hughes Viewpoint for searching for stocks? That's actually the name I gave it on the stock search criteria that's shown at the right. So, okay, I just didn't know where you have your list on the dashboards of different dashboards that you have. Uh, as we as investors, what was the title of that so we'd know what to look for? Yeah, you got to build it yourself using that stack search criteria on the right. Oh, it's actually all right. it's actually just a named uh, search result that I I go back to from time to time. And then I was very comforted. I think it was Irving Kahn who passed away five years ago at 110 years old. He was one of the more senior students of Benjamin Graham, Warren Buffett's mentor. Sure, sure. But I think he I saw I saw him interviewed on TV. And my jaw dropped when he talked about looking at companies near the 52-week low. I was thinking, if a 95-year-old growth investor has that philosophy, it must be nice. <laughs> <laughs> hey, and I, I think we also discovered that in the teachings of Walter Slash, another uh, Graham. Dis dis oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So interesting stuff. So that's where... Business. That's where some of that comes from. So hopefully that answers the question. I noticed that Heiko Class A shares are on that on the search results for today. Yeah, interesting. All right, one last thing. Linda Bergwall asked us to bought, to take a look at, or what are our thoughts on Iron Mountain? And again, I think it, as a a theme, it's fairly attractive. This is a company that does document management services for companies. Um, including hard paper copies and cloud. And uh, if you watch for them, you'll see Iron Mountain trucks running around taking care of their, their customers. And what I've done here is just basically lay out the fundamentals. And uh, she asked us for our thoughts on the company. And one of the reasons I wanted to share this one is, that, you know, this is a, a lower growth company at 3%. Basically, the slope of this red line is 3%, so it's not an exciting growth company. So it's one of those larger companies that Ken was talking about earlier. Uh, but it is a fairly substantially higher yielding company in the 5 to 6% range. So a lot of times when there's a lack of growth, you can make up for that with uh, projected dividend yield. And it actually does look pretty good um, in terms of projected return in the mid-teens. Um, 
it's had a pretty good run just in the last few months. It's gone up 25%. You can see the difference between these two dates back in May and then currently. Um, the one place that gives me a little bit of reservation would be right here. And again, uh, we've talked about companies that have a fair amount of debt, more than a fair amount of debt. And notice that these projected return on value numbers are actually fairly low compared to the average company, which runs about 7%, 6 or 7% right now. And they just have a lot of debt, a lot of liabilities, uh, including long-term debt. You can see that down here. So um, they, they basically are fairly leveraged, if you want to think of it that way. Um, so to a, to a stock investor, that can be a little bit of a precarious position. In order to get to the numbers that are shown in the value line analysis, they need to get to uh, 11 to 12 percent on the, the net margin. That seems kind of ambitious to me. The other thing that comes to, to mind is that you know perhaps this PE is a little bit risky at 27 for a company that looks like this on a stock selection guide or a, a stock study. Uh, so I would be uh, cautious about the, the amount of debt. I'm not saying this is a bad company. I'm just saying that their decision on capital structure is that they are predominantly a debt-based company, and that can leave the shareholders in a fairly precarious position. Any thoughts from uh, Ken or Hugh or Kim? Well, I see in the question box, someone has says IRM is a REIT. I wasn't aware of that. That can cause difficulties when it comes to investment clubs and their treasurers. So you want to check on that. Oh. I hadn't realized this, this company was as leveraged as it is with debt. I wonder what the reason is. Yeah, it's not, I mean, I, if that debt, if that effective interest rate was lower, I would understand it better. I mean, they're paying yeah. four hundred million a year in annual interest, so it's a, it's a it's a fair chunk of change. They've only got not only, they've got nine hundred million in the checkbook. And what do you know? What its asset position is, and what's the breakdown between uh, long term and short term? I guess you could extract it a little bit with that long term debt versus total liability. So they've got you know, 5 billion in, in current liabilities in addition to that long-term debt. And I'm, I'm basically lumping everything into the basket of current liabilities. So yeah, it's a, it's a chunk of change in, in uh, debt. And, and the, I, again, the thing I would go back to just for a, a benchmark for comparison, if you ran this chart on General Electric five, maybe 10 years ago, when things kind of got out of control there for a while with their capital and their uh, their financial services basically becoming 50 to 60% of what was GE at the time, um, you could basically build this same picture where General Electric looked good in one of our stock studies that ignored capital structure. Yet if you put the, the total debt and the massive influence of their of GE capital into it, it was a different story and it basically shed some light on that vulnerability that eventually came home to roost a few years ago. So again, using GE as an example of what can happen to a company, a great company, no, no question about it, GE, world-class, great company. Uh, they can be brought to their knees in a, in a debt crisis, the likes of which we saw 10 years ago. Any other uh, Mark, uh, Mark, Len Douglas makes the point that uh, at the beginning of May, this stock was valued at $35 a share. So uh, COVID hit it really hard uh, and it hasn't returned to where it was pre-COVID yet. Uh, he also uh, reports that in June, uh, they were issuing $1.8 billion in bonds specifically to pay debt. Yeah, so they're leveraging. If I said if I said May, it was March that was at thirty five dollars. If I said May, I was wrong, Mark. Mm -hmm. It was March at thirty five dollars. 
So again, in summary, it's a company with a lot of debt. Uh, you can reach your own conclusions about how well they're managing it or what type of challenges they face. Um, it certainly is an interesting theme, but I would encourage anybody doing a study to you know, be at least aware, or dare I say cognizant, of uh, the impact of potential debt on any company that you study. All right. So with that, I'll leave you with a picture of Burt Lake as we left it uh, here a few days ago. And uh, we will be kicking off the roundtable in a little bit tonight. For those of you who want to do some advanced homework on the roundtable, uh, the three companies that I have so far are BP, the repeat selection by Hugh. Uh, as, I, as I said in the green room, Ken is having a love affair with First Financial, ticker symbol FFIN. And... Uh, I'm going to go with a really beaten up stock, and I'd be interested to hear what Hugh has to say about it, uh, probably making me look bad in the process. Is it Biomarine, Biomarine Pharma? Yeah. So B, ticker symbol is BMRN, and my only interest in that is, again, going back to uh, Hugh's loathing index. It's, it's absolutely loathed and hated by... Uh, everybody but the lawyers who are attempting to sue the company on behalf of shareholders. So, uh, Big sign. so it's a good sign. It's, it's beat up pretty, <laughs> pretty bad. And we'll talk about Mark, that one tonight. Mark, I'm going to suggest that you look at the uh, questions that come out of your report uh, when you close this. Uh, Nick has given us a pretty decent long question about cash flow. It might be the basis for next week's program. Okay, I will do that. All right, any other closing thoughts? So with that, we'll get back to uh, generating some slides for tonight and look forward to seeing everybody there. Okay. Take Hope care, to everybody. See you all tonight. Uh -huh. Good night, everybody. Good afternoon, everybody. Bye. Bye, guys.